Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Tabernacle SDA Church. Welcome to those of you who are online viewing us today. Praise the Lord. We are in the house of God this morning. Amen. It is, the psalmist says, it is a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord. And it is uh, clear in our minds what's going on in the world today. How at the snap of a finger you can, your life can change drastically or just be wiped out. But God is good. His mercies endure forever. This morning, actually this week, we studied God's mission to us, and it's part two of this, this, this uh, mission series. Before we dive right into our, mes our message this, for this week, by chance, for those of you who are viewing online, if you're viewing on YouTube or Facebook, and if you have any questions, go ahead and type it in the chat. Someone will be there to answer your, your uh, questions. And perchance we are not able to answer your questions immediately, then definitely we will respond in the very near future. We also would like to encourage everyone who is viewing online to take the Sabbath school quiz, which will come right after this uh, lesson review. And God is good and his mercies endure forever. So our, our text this morning reads, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads. Father, we want to give you thanks and praise for you are good and your mercies endure forever. We want to ask you please to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remove anything from us that may cause this prayer not to be heard. And forgive us, O Lord, we pray. And now as you have done so, please fill us with your Holy Spirit so that your message will go to thy people and that souls may be one for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ye therefore and, and make disciples. God is in his matchless love looked down through time and he, he made a decision. God said, per adventure, if man sins, I want to make provision for man so that man can be brought right back to his original status. See, when, when you're royalty, people walk around and they look upon you a certain way. When you are royalty, people treat you a certain way. When you are royalty, people expect you to act a certain way. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all royalty. And because of sin, God foresaw that man would forget that he is royalty. And of course, if you forget that you are royalty, your actions are going to reflect what you're forgetting, yes? Your speech is going to reflect what you're forgetting. But God wants to restore that original thought process within the mind. And so God says, I will make provision that mankind will come and have this connection with me. And I will make every possible co connection available. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to study a little bit. We're going to review a little bit. You, we, will, we will see where, what the channel is that God created. We will see what's God, what was God's focus, what was his original idea when he created this mission to save man. We will see the what, the when, the why, the who of God's mission. And we will understand even more so, a little bit more of the much less love of God Almighty. I have an illustrious panel this morning and I'm not going to say much more. I would like for us to, to my immediate right, is Sister Soa. Next to her is Elder Adley. And to my left is Miss Chong. And next to her is Brother McDuffie. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are blessed to be in God's house. So, Elder Adley. Oh, oh, I forgot one quick thing for, for those of us who are in our congregation this morning. If you have questions, to our left and to our right are two mics. Please feel free to come up and ask your questions as we transverse this lesson. Question number one. Elder, it says, explain the work of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as it relates to the salvation of man. And also, why should an understanding of this give us comfort? Thank you, Brother Raymond. Good morning to everyone. Um, so in light of your question, you know, what, you know, what's the triune union's purpose in our salvation and what comfort can we draw from it? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit work together in a loving, harmonious, coordinated mission to bring about the salvation of mankind. So the first thing is the Father. The Father is the initiator of salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So this shows that the Father's love for us and his desire to save us. And it shows that he is the initiator of this mission. The Father sent the Son into the world to accomplish salvation. We find that in John 3, verse 17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. One more thing. The, the Father also plays a role in drawing people to Jesus Christ. In John 6, verse 44, it says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws, draws me to them, and I will raise them up in the last day. The second person is the Son, yes, Jesus Christ. And the lesson talks about that Jesus is the central figure in the work of salvation. He accomplished salvation through his death on the cross, where he atoned for the sins of humanity. And through his resurrection, Jesus not only conquered sin and death, but provided hope of eternal life to those who believe in him. And John 14, verse 6, it says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And salvation comes through faith in him as our Lord and Savior. And lastly, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit plays an important role in our salvation. In John 16, verses 7 through 15, it says that Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide, convict, and empower believers. The Holy Spirit convicts individuals of their needs of salvation, drawing them to Jesus Christ. It also tells us in that same verse that the Spirit regenerates and transforms believers, enabling them to live according to God's will. So understanding the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in salvation offers comforts in several ways. One, as we first started, you know, God initiated the, the, the mission. So the Father's initiation of salvation shows um, his love for us, and that should give us a deep sense of God's care and concern for each and every one of us. Secondly, we have hope through Jesus Christ. Trusting in Jesus as the Savior brings out the assurance of a better and brighter tomorrow. Because of his sacrifice on the cross and his forgiveness of our sins, his role as the way, the truth, and the life assures believers that we have a path in God, and most importantly, the promise of eternal life. And lastly, the last thing I, that I think is also brings comfort is that we have a heavenly guidance, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in conviction, guidance, and transformation and it assures believers that they are not alone in their spiritual journey. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Spirit provides comfort and direction as we navigate through life's challenges. So having an understanding of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and salvation provides believers with the comfort of not only divine love, hope through Christ, and guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And the last thing I want to say is that um, as it relates to this mission, like you were talking about, we're royalty. Um, in spite of all the things that may be happening in the world, there are rumors of wars, there are actual wars happening. There's so many things happening, but God promised that because it's his mission, it should be our mission. And the lesson states something very proper. It says, we now ought to learn because of the tri-union's impact in our lives, because of what they're doing in our life, the mission is not ours. It belongs to God, and as such, it will not fail. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the, 
some, some, some solid, or I should say some very effective words were used. Holy, initiation. I, I, I come up with the word catalyst, savior, channel, and more importantly, tools. At the end of all of this, what does he give us? Hope. See, God didn't just create the plan of salvation and put it in motion and, leave and step aside. He said, no, 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 no. I want mankind to have a clear understanding, not just verbally, but physically. So what did he do? He came in person and demonstrated. It, it, I will reflect on a child. We, we have children, some of us, and we will watch this child struggling to walk. But do we give up? No. We encourage them. The child may grow up and they may try to ride a bicycle, or we will encourage them. They may fall. We encourage them. We, we, we show them ways in which they can, they may try to play sports, and we encourage them. Their schoolwork, we encourage them. And so we continue to support and to sustain their mindset, to, to motivate them and to give them confidence as they go along. God is doing the same thing to us. He provides us with all we need for salvation. But he, he didn't just put it in motion and leave it, like I said earlier. But what he, what he did was he, provided, he provides us with all the tools we need. There is a, a text in the Bible that says, His divine power hath given us everything we need for life and godliness. This is very sweet, ladies and gentlemen. It is so sweet that I, I think I'm going to go over what I'm supposed to allow the panelists to say. So, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. God is merciful. Question number two. Question number two goes to Sister Soa. Oh, please remember, if you're online viewing, and by chance you have a question or two, Someone is, is there waiting and ready to answer your questions. And you may type your questions in the YouTube or Facebook chat platform. Okay? So, moving along. Sister Soa. The mission given to us by God is to make disciples. How should this mandate of God affect the way we minister to people? And what can we do to be more involved in this God-given mission? Good morning. The mission which is mentioned in this question is what is referred to in Christendom as the Great Commission. This is what is expressed in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. This was the charge that Jesus gave the 11 disciples after his resurrection. This mandate holds true for every born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Once we accept him, we too become disciples, for disciples are followers of Christ. This is how the gospel was spread back then in the days of disciple and Paul, and it's still one of the most effective methods of spreading the gospel to the world still. Each one we reach one. How does this mandate affect our lives? And I want to give um, three examples. I, we must be fully surrendered to Jesus, living lives that are true and pleasing in his sight. Number two, I, we must understand that we are working for with God through the precious aiding of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us and convinces people to turn their lives over to God. And number three, we must commit to a relationship with God through daily prayer, studying of his word, the Bible, attend church, and associate with like-minded people who believe in God. And the second part of the question asks, what can we all do to be more involved in this God-given mission? To be more involved in mission, we must witness to others and share our testimonies of what a wonderful change God has made in our lives. Amen. Secondly, we must engage in Bible study 
if others were seeking truth. Teach them the word of God. This is where the preaching of the gospel comes in. We must support, encourage, and exhort the new believers. We must live exemplary lives to those who are seeking or who have accepted Jesus as their savior. To conclude, I would like to end with the statement by Sister Ellen G. White, found in Ministry of Healing, page 143, which says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their goods. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs and their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. Jesus' character must be reflected in us, whether we are at work, at play, in the supermarket, at home or at school. And some other things we can do, we can share meat, we can invite these new believers to a home and give words of encouragement and support. Amen. Sister, you made it clear there is no reason for us not to love our fellow men. God has given us a principle. He demonstrated this principle, how we should love our fellow men, why we should love our fellow men. You mentioned solidarity. You mentioned commitment. You mentioned living. Some of us have all experienced this, uh, this thing where someone, you go to a church, and someone says to you, by chance, are you heading home right now? And you may say no. And they say, would you like to join us for lunch? Then you get to meet someone new. You get to make new friends. You, you get to, 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 to relate to someone at a different level than you saw in church. This person now can pass on this experience that he had or, he, or she had. They, they can now promulgate this throughout their life's history. I remember when we were in, we were in college, there were a, a set of people who would always make sure that we, the college students, were taken care of. They looked out for us, they would pick us up, because of course we didn't have vehicles, they would pick us up and they would ensure that, you know, they would check up on us and make sure that we were okay. And I still see that being done even in our church today. So it's, it's living, being a, a living witness is extremely important and it helps each one reach one. Supporting, extremely important. I, I see uh, someone coming up to the mic. Brother Duke, go ahead. Uh, it was mentioned about making disciples. As a making disciples. Yes. From the last panel. So my question is, uh, when we accept our Lord Jesus Christ, and we become a disciple. Uh, and we did not make disciples of others. Is that, are we failing in our uh, uh, discipleship if we don't make disciples of others? I would like to uh, acquiesce to anyone in my panel before I answer this question. Is there anyone who wants to attack me? Go ahead, Ms. Jump. Good morning, I'm sorry, it's cold. Um, I would say that the word disciple would mean a follower of someone that you look up to as a teacher. Now, we are followers of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus ask us to do? He has commissioned each and every one of us to make disciples of others. So it is Jesus' mission for us to follow his mission of making disciples. Mm -hmm. Now you ask the question that if we are not making disciples, if we're not making disciples, if we are actually um, doing the mission, no. Because for us to be uh, God's, Jesus' main mission is for us to make disciples. So if we're sitting down and not making disciples, we are not participating actively participating in the mission of God. 
Amen. You, you know, Brother uh, Madoke, I'll, I'll join you right. Let's, let's be clear about something, brethren. The mission of making disciples has many facets. So, the Bible tells you also, it says, I gave some teachers, I gave some preachers, etc., etc., etc. Yes? So, because one is preaching, and another one is teaching, and another one is taking care of the sick, it doesn't mean that they're not all in the mission making. It doesn't mean that they're not all making disciples. It doesn't mean that just the preacher is making disciples. Yes? So let's be clear of that. Go, go ahead. Good morning, Sabbath School. Good morning. I also wanted to add um, the context in which was just said, if we're making disciples, that we need to remember that we are not the ones that are actually making the disciples, bringing the people in church. It's actually us being the empty vessels that we are, that God is shining through us, that is using us, that he is doing it. Amen. So we want to make sure that as we are living examples of what we are supposed to follow, that it is not necessarily our words, but more so our actions that show that God is leading us and he will take care of the rest. Amen. Amen. I think your question has been answered, Brother Duke. <laughs> We're going to move on to question number three. And question number three goes to Miss Trump. Right back to you, Miss Trump. In reference to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, what is the eternal gospel? And how does it relate to all the peoples of the world in preparation for Christ's second coming? Okay, as the lesson pointed out, the eternal gospel is the good news of grace offered to all through Jesus Christ. Yes. So it is that good news that God has made provision for our sin, sins by sending Jesus to die for us, to redeem us to God. Um, when we look in Romans 3.25, it says, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. So Christ came, died on the cross for our sins, rose again, went to heaven, and was, was exalted by God and all the heavenly hosts and is now in the most holy place interceding for our sins. Um, Revelation 14, 6 to 12, that is one of our Adventist fundamental and practicing belief, which we also call the three angels message, messages. And it states, and I'm, I'll just read 14, 6 through 7 from the New King James Version. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So we can see that God is calling all mankind back to himself. And he's given this warning, and he wants us as a Christian to spread this warning to all mankind, to let them know that there is going to be a time when Jesus will come back, not as a savior, but as a king and as a judge. Yes. And when he comes back, he wants all those who have accepted his gift to be with him. And so right now, it is our mission to share this good news with everyone, young and old, rich and poor, yes. in the highways and byways. We don't need to be going far overseas. Now, I was a student missionary for a year in the 1040 window in Asia. And 
you know, the simplest of question that a three or five year old would ask, that was puzzling to them because that is not, they have never experienced, they've never heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we can share how much Jesus loved them, it brings them to tears. Mm -hmm. It brings them to tears to know that God loved them so much that they would send someone all the way from America, travel overseas to tell them this good news. Yeah. They wouldn't travel so far to tell them this lie. Mm -hmm. And it stirred their heart to know that, wow, this is a savior who's reaching out to them that will disrupt my beautiful, well, perfectly planned schedule to come and share with them for a year the love of Jesus Christ. And God is calling us, whether we're here in America, in our backyard, or to go overseas in this mission to redeem man. This is the soul and heart of God. And this is the soul of heart of Jesus. And he wants us to do that, however simple, however near, however far we may be. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a thread that runs throughout this mission. And it is the love of God. Now, I lose my, 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 my words whenever I have to speak about the love of God because it, I, I'm going to be honest with you. It blows my mind. Come on up to the mic, sister. It blows my mind. In my, in my humanistic form, it's difficult for me to understand how a God could be so merciful, be so powerful and yet so merciful uh, here in, in, in life, when we see mankind, uh, whoever is powerful is egotistic. Yes? If you, if you think of all the history books and all these, all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar. Yes? As soon as the power reaches that mindset, that, 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 that head, it, it, the egotism shows and, and, and he, oh, this I, this I, this I, this I. And that's all we see. Mankind becomes selfish when power hits his head. God is saying, hey, I am all powerful, but here is the point. My love for you, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever race you are from, wherever you were born, whatever has happened to you in your lifetime, no matter how bad or how good it has been in this life, I love you. And I want you to have a meaningful relationship with me. Um, concerning the question, I really appreciate what my sister, I just came in, but I really appreciate what you're saying because the gospel is to go out. However, when we look also, the emphasis is to worship. It says him, but it says who made the meaning creation. Yes. He is establishing, God is establishing who, he's, who he is. When we look at Paul, we see he went to different places and there were different gods. But God let us know that he is the creator. And he's calling us back. And if you look at this too, it brings us back into the rest. The creator who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of living water. So there's yeah. nothing exempted yeah. from him. So I just want to make that as an emphasis that God is showing, he's, he's telling you, this is who I am. I'm calling my people back to me, the creator of this entire universe. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're coming right back to you, but go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I like the point that you just made, sister. And I know there's a phrase that sometimes gets attached to that, which is we have a job to do. Mm. And I want to rephrase that and say we have work to do. And the reason why that's being rephrased is when you're told you have a job to do, your job is staying in one place. Whereas when you see how Jesus has gone here and there, he's dust his feet off in love, he has work to do, which means he doesn't stay still in one spot. He keeps moving because the mission is always moving. And to get to that final spot, I can't stay in one place. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's remember something very important. Just like it is in our day today, there was division in the church. Some people didn't like other people. 
because of their color, because of what they look like, because of where they were from, because of which, what, what their ethnicity was. That existed in the church back then. The Jews and the Samaritans were at loggerheads even till today. We can see the war that has broken out. It is, it, it's something very, very similar. So what happened back then is still happening today. However, what's most important is that God is saying, there's no room for this. My love encompasses all. My love is for all people. Everyone on the face of the earth. We're going to move right along to question number four. Brother McDuffie, this comes to you. And it reads, explain what it means to be a channel in this mission. What are the building blocks of this channel in relation to the gospel mission? As we think about this question, I want to start with the word disciple. We know that a disciple is a follower of Jesus. In order to do this, we have to have discipline. And something called me to pay attention to these words. I like to play with words. I N are the only two letters that are the difference between disciple and discipline. Mm -hmm. And what I gained from that is, in order to be a disciple, you have to have discipline. In other words, you have to get in line with God's program. Okay. Romans 8.28 and Romans 12.4 are somewhat synonymous, which is talking about how there is a work together for good as well as us being members of one body, that God is calling us to use the skills, talents, and abilities in the unique way that he created us. So we know that an eye cannot be an ear, a nose cannot be a mouth, and so that we all are not going to be serving the same exact way. However, the mission still remains the same. Amen. What is your function? And that's a question that we need to ask ourselves daily. Whatever it is that you are good at, how do we use that for the kingdom of God? And in that, I come with four things. Knowing your purpose, growing in your purpose, serving in your purpose, and living in your purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11 lets us know that he already knows what that is for us. But the question is, do you? And as we, begin, we, as we sorry, continue to become closer to God, God will show us the way to say, here's how I need you to serve. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Pardon me. In 1 Samuel 2, 26... It talks about how he is with man and God, and it lets us know that as we're walking with God, that he has this veil that protects us as we're walking with the just and the unjust. It can be very difficult as one person carrying a light in a cave of darkness, but when you have the power of God behind you, that's what makes the light all the more powerful. Amen. In serving, Ecclesiastes 3.1 reminds us that there is a season for everything. And as you've learned or known what your purpose is by being closer to God, growing in your purpose, knowing that there is a veil over you, serving, going through the mission of I'm doing this repetitively until you can get to, as Jeremiah 32.19 will tell us, to live in our purpose and this is when it becomes second nature when it's no longer a I'm not sure if I should serve this way I'm not sure if this is the gift and talent that I should use I'm not sure if this is the place that I need to be to serve and as we're taking our time through these steps we know number one that God is always going to be with us Number two, as long as we stay close to God, God will always guide us. And number three, which is the most important of them all, as long as you are doing it in love, it will always change the hearts of the unjust. Amen. So as you come up, sister. So being a channel, we, 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 uh, we, look, at, we look at life where we, we, we have 
signals being broadcasted over the, the air. And we look at electricity when we, we'll, we'll plug a, a, a uh, device into an outlet in the wall and we'll get the power that we need to run this device, where, whatever it is, you know, our blender, our TV, whatever the case may be. God wants us to be that link. And Brother McDuffie clearly brought out that we have to submit to him in order to be that link. We have to commit to him in order to, to be this link, this link between God and man. Because that's what he's really calling us to be. He's calling us to be a link, a channel between God and man to clearly transfer what he gives us to everyone who will listen, to everyone who will hear, to everyone who wants to follow, to learn about our creator. He, he, I, I, and not only are we supposed to submit, but we're supposed to be shine, a shining light. Yes, yes like, the, like the moon that reflects the light of the sun. So this is how we are to be a channel in this world, serving God. Go ahead, my sister. And uh, actually, I'm going to look at the fact that God blessed Israel. Israel was supposed to be the channel. They were supposed to witness to the surrounding nations. Mm -hmm. However, they failed. They failed at that, and, and because they failed at that, and we're not going to go into all of that, Christ... God has his mission from the beginning that Christ would come, that Christ would be that channel. And Christ came and he did everything that the mission was provided for from the beginning of the earth. And Christ now fulfilled that by sent, and, and it's to, supposed to be more fulfilled by us. He's saying, go, teach, preach, baptize in the triune God, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commissioned you. Yes. And lo, I'm with you all so. So, brothers and sisters, this is not just about, like my brother saying, it's about us. It's about us. We, we will see later on that we are not here to sit down. No. We are here to proclaim. We are called Christians. We are to proclaim the gospel of Christ Jesus. This is what we are here to do. Amen. So when we hear of all the things that are going on in the world, sure we may not be able to go, but we can pray and we can do what we can here so that men and women will not die Amen. in fear. They will not die all of a sudden not knowing anything. Excellent. And I have been praying for the missionaries. Because those missionaries are there. Some of them are going to die. God forbid. But they're going to put, proclaim the gospel. And that's what we're here to do. Amen. I am, we are almost out of time, ladies and gentlemen. However, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, You shall be my witnesses. Now, when the Bible says, you shall be my witnesses, it's talking about every single person who will hear this message. Every single person who will read his word. You shall be my witnesses. In other words, Christ is calling all of us to be channels. Channels to link God with man. Channels. If you have a, the, the cross ha, has two areas, right? One vertical and one horizontal. And we've mentioned this several times before. The vertical one will signify your commitment, your, your, your link to the Father. And as he downloads, we're going to use this term now, as he downloads to us his grace, his mercy, and his messages, we ought to be reaching horizontally to our brothers and sisters, living the life that counts. We're out of time, ladies and gentlemen, and there is so much more that we would like to expound in this, in this uh, lesson study. But thank you all for being here, my panelists. And of course, thank you to, for those of you who are online viewing. And please remember, any messages you have, any questions, please put them in the chat and uh, we will definitely respond to you. God is wonderful to us and he's merciful and allowed us to be in his course this day. 
please have a well-spent Sabbath. Let's bow our heads. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your good and your mercies endure forever. We give you thanks and praise for allowing us to know, recognize how much you love us and how much you have provided for us to be the channels that you want us to be to the world. Please forgive us from our sins. Direct us now as we try to do your will and help us to stay committed to you and to stay in tune with you so that we can always serve you as you requested. Thanks again and bless us, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, the uh, offering, the Sabbath school offering will be collected. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I am Dr. Judith Ray McCalla, and today we are doing part two of menopause. So let's jump right into it. Our first slide, next slide please, is a quote that on black women and menopause, and I want to share this with you. It's by Dr. Jessica Shepard, she's an OBGYN, and she's a chief medical officer of very well health. And she says, and I quote, while everyone experiences menopause differently, for black women, the change can start sooner, be more physical and emotionally challenging, and cause more severe symptoms compared to white women. So that tells you a lot right there. Next slide. So I wanna show you some of the differences. So black women are 50% more likely to experience hot flashes and night sweats compared to white women. They also have higher rates of depression, 20% versus 15%. Next slide. Uh, we see here that 
On average, menopause starts for black women eight and a half months earlier. And in terms of the night sweats and hot flashes that affect sleep, they last six and a half years for white women, but 10 years on average for black women. So this explains a lot of things, don't you think? Yes. Okay, so next slide. So we have been talking about symptoms of menopause, and I talked about a few last week. And there are 48 symptoms of menopause. We're not going to cover 48 symptoms. We don't have enough time. But I just want to point out a few extra ones today. Dry eyes. So if your eyes are drier than usual, it is a sign of menopause. Remember we talked about having dry skin? Well, the dryness is just not skin. It's pretty much everywhere. So you also have dry mouth. And as a result, you have sensitive teeth and gums, and you can have cavities, and you can have more of a risk of gingivitis based on this. And the other thing that women find most annoying is increased facial hair. Yes, those little things here on the chin. You have to get your little tweezers and pull them out. Um, so we do what we need to do to combat these symptoms. Now, next slide, please. We have some less common symptoms. The first one is heart palpitations or tachycardia where your heart is racing. That is a symptom that some experience. These less common symptoms are not experienced by everyone, but if they are experienced by you, you might want to see a doctor just to make sure that it is a due to menopause and not to something else. We have low blood pressure. We can have dizziness, a burning sensation in the mouth. Sometimes you experience a change in the way your breath smells, or you have a bad taste in your mouth, or a change in the way you smell, your body odor. Some people have unusual neurological sensations. One person told me that they have electric shocks, um, a creepy, crawly feeling under the skin, sometimes numbness or tingleness or itching. All of these can happen, OK? So our next slide. So there's some complications that happen after menopause. Once you hit menopause, you are now at increased risk for heart disease or blood vessel disease. Your estrogen and progesterone were protecting you from these things. But when it's gone, then you are at risk. And remember, heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women. You're also at increased risk for osteoporosis, which is a loss of your bone density. And as a result, you are now at risk for fractures. So we're talking fractures of the spine, of the hip, of the wrist, or the most common. Next slide. You are also, uh, this is an unfortunate uh, complication, increased risk of urinary incontinence. Yes, that means sometimes you just have this frequent, sudden urge to urinate, and then it, something comes out. You leak. You're like, ooh, what happened? Or, this is the most common one, stress incontinence. If you laugh, if you sneeze, if you cough, if you lift something heavy, there it is. So this happens. Um, I was talking to somebody just this week, and she says, I've started wearing you know, protection from that because it's too embarrassing. So protect yourself if this is a problem for you. Another thing that's not on the slide that I do want to mention is if you had um, depression around the birth of your children. So if you had postpartum depression, you are at increase for having major depression at, uh, during menopause. So just be mindful of that if your sadness is just not going away. You want to uh, address that with some treatment. Next slide. So your doctor, if you go to the doctor, uh, the doctor might prescribe some tests for you. One is follicle stimulating hormone and estrogen. That's the FSH. Um, when your FSH levels increase and your estrogen levels decrease, you're in menopause. So the doctor wants to check. And they also check your TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And why? 
because if you have an underactive thyroid, hypothyroidism, it can cause symptoms that look like menopause and they want to make sure that it's not the thyroid problem instead of the menopause. So they want to do those tests. Next slide. So we're talking about medical treatment. Now, remember what I said last week. Menopause is not a disease or a disorder. It's a natural part of aging. But sometimes the symptoms can interfere with your daily life in a significant way. And so you can seek treatment. There is estrogen replacement therapy, which treats the hot flashes and the bone loss. But if you use it for a long period of time, you run an increased risk for heart disease and breast cancer. So you have to weigh that. And there's also vaginal estrogen that eases vaginal dryness and painful intercourse. And you apply the, vagin the, the estrogen via a vaginal cream or suppository or ring, so it's inserted. And it does help with that. Next slide. There are also um, prescription medications that people can use for hot flashes. Gabapentin, clonidine, just to name a couple. And there's some antidepressants that are also used. They're called SSRIs that can be helpful. You need to be your best advocate. Before you decide on anything, you and your doctor need to talk about your options and look at the risks and the benefits and make an informed decision. Not everything should be for everyone. And finally, I want to talk about herbal remedies. And herbal remedies, um, black cohosh is a common one that people like to use, but there's little evidence that it helps with hot flashes. In fact, it is harmful to your liver and it is unsafe if you've had a history of breast cancer. Do not take this. There are other herbal supplements that are listed like red clover, don quai, wild yam, prim, evening primrose oil. All of these things have not shown a lot of scientific evidence and there are harmful effects to most of them. So my word of advice to you is the FDA doesn't regulate herbs. And so some of them can be dangerous and they can interact with the medications that you're already taking. Do not put your life at risk just to take herb because you think an herb is harmless. It is not. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you're having hot flashes during the day, here are some nice little tips. Dress in layers. Take him off as the day, as it happens, you take off the jacket. And then you get cold, you put back on the jacket. It's okay. Just dress in layers. Wear natural fibers, cotton, linen, silk. Breathe, so use those. Carry a portable fan. I see women with the fans. Use your fan. Try cold water. Sometimes it helps as, you, as it starts. It can decrease the temperature internally and it helps. Try a cooling towel around your neck. Next slide. If you have it at night, what can you do? Have a cooler bedroom. Your husband will be happy because he tends to want it cooler anyway. Drink a small amount of cold water before you go to bed. Layer your bedding so you have different layers. When you're cold, like I, I have three layers on mine. Take off the first one, take off the second one, left with one, add the first one, add the second one. It's okay. It's your bed, do as you wish. And have a change of night clothes next to the bed if it gets bad and you need to change. You don't wanna to have to get up and go to the bathroom. Just whip it off, put on something else. Make your life easier. Final slide. I want to just say that here are some tips that we should all be following regardless, but it helps to lower your risk for heart disease and osteoporosis. Eat a healthy diet. Fruits vegetables, eat organic if possible, reduce or eliminate animal products. Secondly, get enough calcium and vitamin D. If you need supplements, take them. Three, be physically active. That means 150 minutes of walking or some other kind of exercise every week. Maintain a healthy weight. If you don't know what it is, go online and use a BMI calculator. Put in your height and your weight, and it will tell you if you're healthy or not. And finally, if you're smoking, stop. 
Thank you for your attention, and I hope that we can all traverse menopause more successfully. Thank you.